Okay, so today we'll talk about cervical vertebrae. We're going to begin cervical vertebrae talking about what's called considered typical cervical vertebrae, and this is C3 through C7. We're going to skip C1 and C2 for the moment, and then we'll come back and talk about them because they have some different structures that basically make them atypical. So this is a typical cervical vertebrae here, <coughs> C3 through C7. Looking at the superior view, we have the body, which is the anterior part up here. We're going to see some changes in the cervical versus the thoracic and lumbar, where we start to uh, get smaller in the bone, but then we start to change the structure where off of the body, the pedicles and the lumbar and the thoracic came directly posterior. Now in the cervical, they go posterior lateral, because remember, we're trying to, trying to spread out and create a foundation to hold the skull. We have, so we have the body, we have the pedicles, we have the lamina, we have the spinous process. Now, at the pedicle laminar junction, we're going to have our transverse process that comes off. In the cervical spine, the transverse process still is lateral, but it, faces, it actually goes a little anterior, whereas thoracic and lumbar, they go straight lateral. So this has to do with some of the muscle attachments where the nerves come out. Then the other thing we look at too, at the pedicle laminar junction, we have these superior and inferior articular processes that are present. Now remember, in the lumbar spine, the superior articular processes with facets face like this. In the thoracic, we said they flatten out. In the cervical, they're gonna to start to tilt anterior a little bit. And then when we get up to C1, C2 here shortly, we're gonna see that they flatten out like this to hold the skull. So these are our normal structures that we have. So again, the pedicles, got the body, lamina, spinous, transverse process, superior and inferior articular processes with facets or facets. Now, let me get a different view here. So this is a typical cervical vertebrae. Now, remember, you don't need to be able to point out that this is a C3 or a C4 or a C5. Just know that typical is C3 through C7. Now, there are three new processes we're going to find in these typical cervical vertebrae that we haven't seen in thoracic or lumbar vertebrae. The first two that we'll talk about involve the transverse process. We can see here this whole transverse process has this uh, concavity for the intervertebral foramen where the spinal nerve will come out from the vertebral foramen. In this concavity, we end up with tubercles on the, both the front and the back of the transverse process. So we'll label these. Uh, we'll draw them over here. So I'll put a blue dot on this one, and I'll put a green dot on this one, and I'll label them over here. So the blue dot is the anterior tubercle, oh, I'm sorry, anterior, I'm sorry, anterior transverse tubercle. And then the green one is on the posterior transverse tubercle. Okay. Now, we have these tubercles on these transverse processes. And this allows for muscle attachment and other things of that nature. I'm not sure that we've actually talked about a tubercle um, to this point. So a tubercle is a small bump on a bone for muscle attachment. So tubercles, let's write this over here. A tubercle is a small bump on a bone for muscle Attachment. Okay. And that's what we have there. So, anterior, posterior, transverse tubercles. The next new structure that we have in the cervical spine, and this um, structure is the transverse foramen. This is a hole in the transverse process 
so the vertebral artery can actually run through that. It actually runs up from the vasculature in the upper chest, comes up and then creates uh, blood supply to the base of the brain. And that's that vertebral artery. The transverse foramen is present in all cervical vertebrae. Right now we're talking about typical cervical vertebrae, but C1 through C7, all seven cervical vertebrae have a transverse foramen for the vertebral artery. Okay. Now the last thing that's new in the cervical spine, especially in these typical vertebrae of C3 through C7, are these processes on top of the vertebral bodies right here. So these can be called a couple things. They can be called the uncus of the, of the body or the uncinate process. If we draw a little diagram over here. So at first, when I draw this, I'm gonna put C2 up here just as a block. This is looking at the body from an anterior view. So C3 is gonna have a body that has these uncinate processes that are going to cut the bottom edge of the body of C2. This can get bigger, so here's C4, here's C5. I'll just leave C6 and C7 off, but it's present like this, and this is how they stack up. So these uncinate processes create a cup that the block of the cervical vertebrae above it, the body can sit in there and it creates lateral stability, okay? So these are called an uncus or an uncinate process. Uncinate process is more commonly used, just so you know. I would know uncinate, okay? All right, now, we get a special joint that's created right here with the uncinate process cupping the vertebral body this joint right here, I'm going to circle these real quick. These are called uncovertebral joints, or they're known as the joints of von Buschka. Von Buschka's joints joints of von Luschka. So these are found between C2 all the way down to C7. So you got C2, C3, C3 and C4, 4 and 5, 5 and 6, 6 and 7. That's because of these uncinate processes and it provides lateral stability. Okay. So transverse process has anterior, posterior, tubercle, Okay, we can see those listed here. Here's the, oh, sorry. Here's the anterior tubercle. Here's the posterior tubercle. We have transverse foramen. We have the uncinate process. Now, one thing I want to point out in our diagram real quick on the spinous process, you're going to notice on some of these cervical vertebrae that there is a split or a bifid spinous. That is unique to the cervical spine because they overlap. You can see here's the bifid spinous right here. Not every cervical vertebrae, three through seven, will have a bifid spinous, but I just want you to be aware of that. Like some xiphoid processes uh, split or bifurcate and some do not. It's just the way it happens, it's okay. 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 Now let's talk atypical cervical vertebrae. So now let's get to talking about C2, and then we'll talk about C1. I'm going to pass C1, and I'll go to C2 right here. Now, C2, and I know this is listed on your diagram for you, but this is cervical number two, or C2. This is called the axis. The axis, or C2, is because this is our pivot point. Most of our cervical rotation happens between C1 and C2. Here's a superior view of C2. We can see that C2 has a body. The pedicles aren't out in the back or to the, they actually come directly on the side. So the pedicles are right here and that's labeled for you in your diagram. These are the pedicles. They come out, we get superior and inferior articular processes, superior articular facet and inferior articular facet. 
The transverse processes come out to the side. They're really small. The transverse processes on C2 do not have anterior and posterior tubercles. They just have the process. C2 also has a transverse foramen. C2 has a lamina on both sides, and it also has a spinous process. Now, what is new to C2 is this pivot point or this odontoid or dens structure right here. So I'm gonna circle this right in through here. This is called the dens or the odontoid process. This structure is the pivot point for C1 to rotate around. This allows for the majority of the rotation of the head and the neck. So really the big change here in C2 is the dens or the odontoid. The, the only vertebrae you're gonna find like this is C2. Now, the pedicles are still present, but they go out to the side laterally versus going posterior whatsoever. Okay. Now, let's talk about C1 for a second, and then we're going to put C1 with C2. So, C1 is the most atypical vertebrae in the spine. The only process that C1 has that all the other vertebrae have are the transverse processes right here. You got a transverse process on both sides. Okay. These are, um, these tra this vertebrae is C1, so it's in the cervical spine, so it does have a transverse foramen like all seven cervical vertebrae. Instead of a body, there's an opening of C1. So then there's an anterior arch. This anterior arch has an anterior tubercle. This is on your responsibility list. This opening here, instead of a body, this is a space for the odontoid process of C2 to stick up through. So we're looking at a top view of C2 as it um, articulated here. We'd see the top of the dens right here of the odontoid. So cervical one or atlas structures, transverse process, transverse foramen, anterior arch, anterior tubercle. You can see then that on the posterior side of C1, there's a posterior arch, and instead of a spinous process, there's a posterior tubercle. One way to tell front and back is the posterior arch and tubercle are larger than the anterior arch and tubercle, okay? Now, between the arches, we have these masses of bone. We have, these are called <coughs> lateral masses, so we don't have superior and inferior articular processes, we have lateral masses of C1. The superior articular facet and the inferior articular facet of C1 sit on both the superior and the inferior side of the lateral masses. One thing I'm going to add here about uh, the superior articular facet of C1, the superior articular facet of C1 is concaved for articulation with occipital condyles. So remember when we did the skull, we said condyles, occipital condyles. A condyle is a convex smooth surface for articulation. And most of the time it articulates with a, um, with, with, a, with a fossa or a concaved uh, structure. So you got convex where it's rounded and then it's gonna articulate with a concave so it can rotate around. And those occipital condyles will sit right here. Okay. Let's look at C1 and C2 together. And then that'll finish where we're at with the cervical spine. So we'll scroll up a little bit. Here we have a diagram that shows C1 and C2 articulated together. Here's C2. 
we see the body of C2 and the odontoid or DENS process that sticks up. It sticks up behind the anterior arch of C1. What stabilizes and holds C1 on top of C2 or the around the uh, DENS is when you put C1 and C2 together, the DENS or odontoid process sticks behind the anterior arch of C1 instead of the body of C1. And then like the diagram shows, we have this transverse ligament of C1 that runs from the lateral masses behind the odontoid <coughs> process and holds it in place so this doesn't slide on one another. If this were to happen, if you were to break this transverse ligament, you would get slippage of C1 on C2 and you would sever the spinal cord, which would be bad. Other things that can cause this would be fractures of the, uh, of the anterior and posterior arches of C1, and then that way it would allow sliding that way too. These are called, that's called a hangman's fracture. The other way, one of the most common ways you'll see a hangman's fracture is when someone is riding in a vehicle and they're not wearing a seatbelt and there's an accident and a person is flown forward and they go head first into a windshield that will crush the cervical vertebrae one and cause what's called a hangman's fracture. Other things that can be a problem are, are odontoid or DENS fractures, like if you get a fracture at the base of the odontoid process, then this whole structure can slide. So the stability is really important. The articulation between C1 and C2 around the odontoid process, you can see that the, when you study these, notice that the inferior articular facets of C1 are flat and the superior articular facets of C2 are flat and this allows for the odontoid to be a pivot point for the axis around it. And that's where most of the cervical rotation occurs. Okay, that's the cervical spine.